I'm very excited to uh, tell you this fascinating story that I discovered about five years ago. And um, basically uh, introduce myself uh, as Adam just did, and letting you know that um, I'm the founder and owner of Jewish Mallorca, uh, some people spell it the correct way, which is M-A-L-L-O-R-C-A. Uh, Mallorca is the way you would pronounce that in Spanish. And many people present, uh, present uh, pronounce it Mallorca, if you're coming from Argentina, for example. So many people spell it with a J. So if you're looking for us later after the session, we do spell it with a J. We like to say, we put the J in Mallorca. And, uh, and basically, yeah, our, our mission, uh, our vision, excuse me, is that we believe passionately in the power of history telling to change attitudes, inspire connections, and revive the cultural diversity of Mallorca Island. And our mission is to offer an interactive learning experience that engages both visitors and residents alike and sparks further curiosity. And that is what I'm here to do today. Hopefully, it's to spark further curiosity because what I'm going to share with you today is a history that spans the course of 2,000 years. And there's so much more to be looking at. So uh, we're going to give you a crash course into the Jewish and converso history of Mallorca Island. Uh, again, this is just a highlights, and so if it feels like I'm going fast and running through it, it's because I am. Uh, but the good news is that we just came out, uh, not even a week ago, um, with a new virtual tour, uh, right? It's, uh, it's online and it's, uh, it's available to, uh, for purchase, but I'm so excited to tell all of you that are attending the session today that um, afterwards via email, we're going to share it with you guys uh, for free. And, uh, and hope that you will share it around as well. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out, right? So going right into it, um, I'd love to share uh, a PowerPoint with you guys and, um, and basically tell you a little bit uh, about how I came to be uh, in Mallorca Island. So basically, my name is Donnie Rothstein, uh, my son, my, um, excuse me, my son is named Oren, that's irrelevant. I'm, I am the son of uh, my father, who's from Netanya, Israel, originally, and my mother is from Westchester, New York. I basically studied a year in, in, when I was in college in Madrid, and that is when I, uh, I fell in love with the, with the country of Spain. And in November 2014, through networking, uh, I was able to land a job in Mallorca uh, with a company called Palma Pictures, producing TV commercials here. And that was incredible for me because I'd never been to Mallorca before. Uh, and so I just took a, a jump and said, I got to take a break from New York and, uh, and go explore this desire to, to come back to, to, to Spain where, where I was studying abroad many moons ago. Uh, well, sure enough, I uh, was under the impression that I was going to be the only Jewish person in the entire island of Mallorca. Uh, I only know of smallish communities in Madrid and Barcelona. And I was okay with that. You know, I grew up in New Jersey, in New York. Um, my mother is a, a Jewish educator. Um, I grew up in a, a conservative reform household. So I was okay to, to possibly be the only Jew on an island for a while. And it was amazing when I was in Barcelona, I was at a high holiday service uh, at a, a community called Atid, which is, was reform, now it's Masorti. And at the end of the service, everyone went around introducing themselves. And one of the people who was there was the president of the Jewish community of the Balearic Islands, which Mallorca is a part of, okay? Uh, just to make sure everyone knows where it is, Mallorca is just due south of Barcelona and just east of Valencia. So it's in between Spain and Italy in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, and it's part of the Balearic Islands. So I was quite ast astonished to know that there is a Jewish community of the Balearic Islands. And so when I went there uh, and I moved, I uh, took the president up on his offer to, to attend Friday night services. Uh, there's no rabbi, there's no chazan, it's all led by volunteers, and it's orthodox. It was actually started in 1987 by a group of British Ashkenazi Jews that were kind of holidaying down in Mallorca and decided to retire there, and, and they created the, the synagogue that, that is still present today. And, you know, I, I, I'm not necessarily uh, super comfortable with the mechitza, with men and women sitting separately, but of course, uh, beggars are, are not to be choosers. I was very excited just to have a synagogue there. And this moment defined uh, the rest of my story. Basically, the first time I went there, 
we were davening on a Friday night. It's the only time that the shul is open. And we skipped over the Kaddish as if we didn't have a minion, as if we didn't have 10 Jewish men in that synagogue. And I remember counting the men's section, 14 men. And I couldn't understand, maybe they count minions differently here. I was very confused. And I turned to the gentleman next to me and I said, why are we skipping if we have a minion, obviously? And he said to me, and I will never forget this, um, oh, uh, some of these men are not Jews, they're chuetas. And I'd never heard the term chueta before. Uh, raise your hand, I'll flip through the, uh, the participants, if you have never heard this term chueta before, obviously under, before knowing the session today. Okay, so a number of people. Um, basically, the, uh, raise your hand now if you don't mind, just raise your hand if you have heard of the term marano before. Okay, a number of people, more people. Um, so right, so marano is Spanish and Chueta is Catalan, because here in Mallorca they speak Mallorquin, which is a dialect of the, uh, the Catalan language. Um, just gonna be checking on to see if I have any notes from, speak a little slower, thank you so much. Um, so Murano, I grew up in Hebrew school, learning that it meant, I thought it meant crypto Jew, someone who was secretly practicing Judaism while uh, being a professed uh, Catholic or Christian uh, to the outside world. And uh, a quick short anecdote, uh, my wife Carla, who I met in Barcelona not three weeks after moving to Mallorca, so one could say it was quite beshert that I was to come here, um, moved to Mallorca to, for us to live together and we found a dog that was homeless on the street. And so we took the dog in, we named him Taco because he literally eats everything in sight and he's this small little terrier. And I'll never forget also walking around our first time with our dog in the neighborhood with Taco and he started eating something, you know, something gross, something disgusting that was on the ground because he's a street dog. And Carla, my wife who speaks Spanish natively, said in Spanish, hey, what are you doing, you little marrano? And I was like, so confused. I was like, well, wait, is my dog secretly Jewish? Should I get him like a doggy yarmulke or something? Like, I'm very confused why she just called him that. I said, Carla, why would you say something like that? Uh, and she said, what? I just called him Marano. And I'm like, yeah, but that means someone who's secretly practicing Judaism. She goes, no, it doesn't. Marano means um, like use, it's, something disgusting or someone who shouldn't be eating something or someone who's dirty or something who's, uh, who's uh, like, lo like low class. And it comes from the word maran, which means pig in Spanish. And so I just thought growing up that marano, you know, meant crypto Jew. And actually it's a quite um, despective word. It's um, a derogatory term. And if you were to meet someone who uh, has Jewish roots or, um, believes that they come from Jewish ancestors, basically you would call them converso and not the word marano. So the word uh, chueta is the same thing, and this is how it's written in Catalan, els chueta, the chuetas. And it's, uh, my presentation is in Catalan today as a form of being inclusive and, and sharing, so I'll be translating for you. Uh, historia, history and ethnicity. So the three, um, beliefs, theories that they, they believe where this word comes from. One is French. Uh, the word for dog is chien. And also female owl, like an ominous bird, is chouette. And I don't really go for that theory because they don't speak French here. Uh, but I have read that that is uh, one of the, the theories. The other one is similar to marano. Uh, the word shuya in Catalan actually means uh, pork or bacon. And so the reason why Moranos were, were called this, there's two theories. Uh, one is because they believe that when the Inquisition would take them out and in public, they would force them to eat pork and see if they would turn away or not. And another theory I just learned at Limud, Birmingham this past December, uh, which was that the Jews who did not convert actually labeled the Jews who had been converted either forcibly or via their own choice as Moranos because now they're Christian and now they're allowed to, to eat pork. I never thought of it that way before. Chueta and Shuya, the connection between pork and the, the term Chueta is actually quite the opposite because as you're gonna learn on this presentation today, Chuetas are marked people. They're people that have 
one or two of the 15 last names here in Mallorca Island, and everyone here, nowadays, if you're older than 50, 67 years old, the younger generation, not so much, everyone knows who they are because they carry this last name, okay? And they believe that because they knew who they were, they always were trying to prove that they were Catholics and that they were more Catholic than the other Catholics. So there's a theory that they would take their grills out and be cooking it in public to show everyone that they're eating pork, that they are dealing with, with bacon or, or pig. Uh, and so they would hopefully prove that they are no longer practicing Judaism. Some believe that some would actually be showing that they would use and deal with pork, as you can smell it, it's very obvious, but inside, perhaps, they were keeping kosher and not eating it. And there's a lot of interesting uh, theories about the Mallorquin food and, where, and that some of it has Jewish roots, as hopefully we'll find uh, about today as well. And the last theory is that the word for Jew in Catalan is Jewel, okay? And a not nice way to call someone Jewish is Jueto, you little Jewish person, okay? And listen to the sound of it, Jueto and Chueto. So I find this rather fascinating because Marano does not sound like judío, which is Jewish or Jew in Spanish. But Shueto and Jueto are very, very similar. So um, as you can see, these are pictures uh, that I've pulled up for you. This is a street in Palma that has been relab relabeled by its old name, Carrer del Jueos, okay, Street of the Jews. And it has a little menorah here at the bottom. And here you see people grilling. This is a very popular holiday in Palma. It's in January. It's called San Sebastian. And everyone comes out to grill their foods. Mainly it's pork. I have to go around and uh, asking for a, for a kosher barbecue, which is, which is complicated at best. So again, broad strokes of the history of the Jewish Converso and Shueta history of Mallorca. Um, we know that there are Jews uh, living in the Balearic Islands, possibly at the turn of uh, 2,000 years ago, right after the Second Temple was destroyed in the year 70. They believe that Romans uh, took Jews out to other parts of the Mediterranean basin. And we know for a fact in the 400s that there was a Jewish community living not in Mallorca, but in Menorca. And we know this because the Bishop Severus had a letter where he talks about the Jewish community of Menorca and how he, he would like to convert them to Christianity. So we know for a fact that uh, since starting in the 400s, there is Jewish presence on the Balearic Islands. Um, just going back to our overall timeline, there are medieval Jews living here until the year 1435, when an event happens we'll talk about in a second. And from 1435 to 1691, once again, we know from records of the Inquisition that there is, in my opinion, this phenomenon of crypto-Jews, people who are so passionate that they are Christian on the outside, but secretly practicing Judaism on the inside. And they are also called conversos, and they are also called new Christians. And so in the year 1691, another terrible event happens, which we'll learn about in a second. And from then on, these people are called Chuetas, or people of Sejel Street, which is the ghetto that they were forced to live in. Even though they were Catholics, they were forced to live in a certain area. And also for sure, they were called people of the street, okay? So this is your, your highlights view. So we know that there are Jews living amongst the Amalads, the um, Vandals, the Visigoths, all the different people that were conquering uh, Iberia uh, and, and Mallorca, uh, including the Muslims. And so in the Moros arrived to Mallorca in the 700s, and they are conquered by Jamie I in the year 1229, actually on December 31st, 1229. Jamie I from Aragon comes and uh, he brings with him many Jews from uh, the Aragon area, but the Jews that were brought from Aragon meshed with the Jews that were already living very, very well, actually, under Muslim rule in Mallorca, okay? And this is when the first Jewish quarter is established. Uh, it's called the Kai, C-A-L-L. -L. We'll learn about that in a second. And basically from the 1200s to the 13, 1390s, 
You have an incredible amount of Jewish philosophers, mathematicians, rabbis, uh, an incredible, incredible uh, like group of Jews that really were so integral to the Mallorquin society. I, two people I want to highlight is uh, actually Jafuda Ben Kreskes and his father, Kreskes Ben Abraham. They made a map in 1375 called the Catalan Atlas that you can see here on the PowerPoint that I'm sharing with you. And it's incredibly detailed. You see Italy here, you see Italy and Portugal here. And this is the Mediterranean Sea. And right here, you have this red slab of paint and that represents the Red Sea that's next to Israel. And did, many, many people saw after these maps because they were many, so many detailed, saw after these maps as we can so see. Detailed. As we can see. Yeah, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna actually, hopefully, uh, you can hopefully, uh, thank you so much. Let me know if I need the uh, headsets back on, but I'm gonna try and speak louder so everyone can understand. Uh, in August 2nd, 1391, you have the terrible event, the attack on the Jewish quarter of Palma. The reason in, behind this is because what were some of the Jews that, uh, the jobs that the Jews had? Money lending, because I did not know this when I learned, I started reading and going into this history, that at the time, Catholics could not lend money and charge interest to another Catholic. So the king, in his infinite wisdom, said, okay, we'll let the Jews do this. And so the Jews became money lenders all throughout Sepharad. Uh, and in Mallorca, they played a prominent role. They were living in not one, but two different Jewish quarters in the city. And they were very connected to the noble class and, and to the royalty. They were actually property of the royalty. So in 1391, when the... Uh, Farmers uh, and the campesinos came because they were suffering from famine, from the, uh, uh, the Black Death, La Pesta, the plague, uh, as well as too many taxes. They actually did not attack the Jewish quarter right off the bat. They went after the nobles and the royalty. They were um, kept safe the, uh, in the Belver Castle, along with some other wealthy Jewish members as well. And then the rebellion went after the Jewish quarter because it was unprotected and because the Jews were very closely associated with the noble class, with uh, the people that were um, lending all of, the, uh, all of the money and the debts. Uh, unfortunately, it's a terrible event that 300 men, women, and children were killed that day out of a Jewish quota of around 2,000. And many, 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 um, Books were, were, were burnt because this is where people kept the debts, obviously. And this started the first kind of uh, exile for Jewish families that had been uh, living for you know, hundreds of years in Mallorca. One of them was Jafuda Ben Kreskes, Kreskes, this famous map maker who would later convert. His name was Jaume Ribas. And he went to Portugal to start another uh, map making school in Portugal. In 1393, uh, the Jewish population in Mallorca was forced to wear these rodeas, they're called, uh, these wheels of yellow and red. That's the colors of Aragon, which to me uh, obviously brought back uh, symbolism to what Jews were forced to wear in, under Nazi Germany. And I, I, I think this slide is important because it's, for me, um, emblematic of you know, what we do and don't know about history. Uh, and the more that we can learn, which is what we're doing today at Limud, um, the, the better we can be as, as people and the better we can be prepared for ourselves in the future. Uh, moving right along. <clears throat> in 1435, you have what's called the mass conversion of the Jews of Mallorca. Basically what happened was there was a rumor that had got started that the rabbis of the Jewish quarter had reenacted the passion of Christ on a Muslim slave. And this angered the, uh, the population. And this time they wanted to completely annihilate the Jewish community. Uh, the rabbis suggested that instead of, because you have to remember, there's an island. So there's not this option to leave like many other places in Spain. Uh, so 
It was either convert or die. And those are your options. So uh, in 1435, the entire Jewish community converts hundreds of them in a church that is still standing today, the Church of Santo Lalia. And this is fascinating in my opinion, because if you're one person and you go through a, a conversion, then I can understand that that's um, actual and legit. But hundreds of people all going into a church, getting holy water sprinkled on them and then coming out as Christians, mm, perhaps they were doing it to save themselves. And I actually believe that's probably what the old Christians of Mallorca believed as well. I don't think they were so welcoming saying, oh, can't wait to tell you all the cool things about being Catholic. I probably thought, we don't trust you. We suspect that you're doing this to save yourselves. We're going to um, come up with something called the Spanish Inquisition to find out and root out who is a true convert and who is a heretic who is still practicing the law of Moses is what they called it at the time. Um, this is fascinating because think about it. In 1492, that's when you have the expulsion of the Jews from all of Sepharad. Well, that didn't apply to the island of Mallorca. In 1492, nobody left Mallorca because 60 years before that, they'd all been converted to Christians. So this is super, super important when we go and explore this notion of crypto Jews and later on the Chuetas. By the way, I'd like to give 10 minutes for questions. So if you have questions, please keep them. Also, I'm gonna ask Lingu North America if I can, yes, I can save the chat. So by all means, put your questions there and emails and I'm happy to get back to you. 1478, you have the establishment of the Spanish Inquisition. And in 1488, you have the establishment of the Mallorquin Inquisition, which is possibly one of the most brutal inquisitions in all of the land. And look at the date, it was, the, it was in existence until 1834, almost 400 years of the Mallorquin Inquisition. So in the first couple of years, you have uh, the Inquisition pretty much exclusively working against conversos. Obviously the Inquisition was against gypsies or people from different Christianity or homosexuals, anyone that was uh, the other. Uh, but specifically in these opening years, they were uh, against the conversos, those who had recently converted to uh, Christianity. And just so you know, when you see these words here, 535 people were relaxed and 234 were reconciled. Uh, when you're reconciled in the Inquisition terminology, it means that you were allowed to live, but you had your possessions taken away, you were fined, you possibly had to um, be in prison for a certain amount of time, and you also had to carry a San Benito, which is a big X. And so everyone would know that you are a relaxed heretic. Uh, relax, relax, the word, is, is quite a misnomer in my opinion. It means you were relaxed to the secular arm, which means that the Catholic Church judged you and says, okay, we believe with all of the information that you uh, are still practicing Judaism. We're going to relax you to the secular arm. We're going to give you to the Dominicans, who were the ones that instrumented uh, the torture and the ex and execution. And when you were relaxed, it meant you were to be executed. Um, just a quick note I'd like to say, from 1435 to 1670s, you have this, uh, once again, phenomenon, in my opinion, of crypto-Jews. And you'll see a book in the, in the end of my slideshow that I highly recommend called The Chuetas of Mallorca, where it talks about how did you keep Judaism when there's no synagogue and there's no rabbi and there's no, you're not allowed to practice that religion. A couple of uh, people believe they kept it through food by uh, fasting on certain fast days, uh, by trying to keep kosher as best as possible. Also Shabbat was very important. There's a nice saying that I've heard, I'm sure you guys have heard it before, that, uh, the, that Jews did not keep Shabbat, but Shabbat kept the Jews. And this is very interesting because on Saturdays, I've also read that inquisitors would walk through, you know, the place where the conversos would still live and look up at the chimneys. And if they didn't see any smoke coming out, it meant maybe there was uh, a, someone who was Judaizing, someone who was practicing Judaism by not lighting a fire or not cooking on Shabbat. And so a lot of this is fascinating. And one of the things that I was blown away in my research when I learned is that the favorite holiday for crypto Jews living in Mallorca was none other than the surprising holiday of Purim. Usually on my tours, I take a guess and no one can guess it and whatnot. And the reason is because Esther, 
in their opinion, was like their matron saint. You know, she was the first secret Jew in Jewish history. You know, the king did not know that she was Jewish until she told him. And so they would keep the fast of Esther incredibly, they almost treated it as if Yom Kippur is what I read in this research. And we know this from all the records of the Inquisition. Basically, they would prepare a huge meal. They would go into a room with all their family, close the door so their servants wouldn't see them. And they would stare at their food all day long. And that was their way of actually repenting, uh, atoning for their sins because they were so, so sad that they could not be excellent Jews in, in Hashem's opinion because they couldn't do all of the mitzvot. mitzvot. They couldn't do circumcision. They couldn't have uh, bar mitzvah. They, they couldn't do so many things. So by really passionately celebrating or honoring, observing the fast of Esther, that was their, their way of... Um, of showing that. And I find some interesting words, etymology is one of my passions as well. Um, Esther, I've read, can, can come from the Hebrew word lehastir, which means to hide, as well as uh, the fast, the fast of Yom Kippur in Hebrew, som Yom Kippur, som Tishba'ab. All of the fasts are called som in Hebrew, with the exception of one, ta'anit Esther, which actually comes from the Hebrew word lanui, which is uh, torture, is the word. So when I hear torture of Esther, I think of that torture that the secret Jews did themselves. And the last uh, word I'll play I'll share with you is Yom Kippur may come from Yom Kippurim, which translates to a day like Purim. Never today in like a 21st century uh, American Jew perspective would I ever associate the holiday of Purim with Yom Kippur. But in this research of uh, the Jewish history of Mallorca, uh, it's interesting to make these uh, connections. So what happens in 1670s that is, sets the tone for uh, the destiny of, of these 15 families uh, and all of their descendants? Uh, there basically is new fervor amongst the Mallorquin Inquisition due to a malshin, right? Someone who uh, has tattletold, uh, tattletold on them. And you have to remember, the new Christians would never marry with the old Christians because, first off, the old Christians would not want to taint their family line by marrying with someone who has Jewish blood, Jewish roots, but the new Christians, some of them who would be potentially secretly practicing Judaism, would not want anyone to marry and bring in and see that they were lighting candles on Friday night, etc. So these two different types of Christians were kept very separate uh, until the 1670s when the rabbi, they call him the rabbi at the time, meaning the leader of the crypto-Jewish community. We know his name. It's Raphael Valls, V-A-L-L-S. You see that there. He organizes a boat escape. Where are they going? To Livorno, which is a merchant state in Italy that's not controlled by the papacy. And many Catalan Jews, many Mallorquin Jews would go to Livorno. There's actually a saying here in Mallorca, still today, which is like, if you go to Livorno, no retorno. You know, like if you want someone to get out of here, you like, go to Livorno, because it comes from these times of the Inquisition of secret Jews going to Livorno and never coming back. Unfortunately, uh, this boat never was able to escape because a big storm came up. And there was probably about 40 people on this boat by an English captain. And the date was March 7, 1688. And they had to get off the boat and sneak back into the Jewish quarter at night, which remember, the Palma is a, a walled city at this point, so very kept very closely guarded. The Inquisition is there waiting for them and unfortunately catches them. And over 250 family members uh, of this secret Jewish community were later arrested, put under torture for three years. And in 1691, uh, this is the, the terrible year where the Acto de Fe took place. Uh, this is basically a public execution. And 37 Chuetas were actually burned at the stake. Uh, 34 of them chose to repent and say, I'm sorry for practicing Judaism. I want to die a good Christian. They are killed the easy way, which means garroted, strangled, and then their bodies are burned. And still something that when I, I'm speaking to so many people, uh, uh, I don't get emotional per se, but I, I come to a point in the presentation where I'm so um, moved to share this with you because when I learned about it, I couldn't believe we didn't study this in Hebrew school. Three people, and their names are Rafael Valls, Katerina Taronji, and Rafael Benito Taronji, her younger brother, 22 years old. Katerina had 42 years old, and Rafael was 52 years old. They withstood torture for three years, and at the time, at the moment that they know they were going to die, 
they still refuse to give in to the Mallorcan Inquisition. In my opinion, they're martyrs to the Jewish uh, faith. And they said, we were born Jewish, we're gonna die Jewish. And they were burned alive in front of 30,000 people. And all of this is chronicled in a book called The Triumphant Faith, uh, which was written by uh, Franciscan, um, Francisco Garau, um, who was a priest. And he wrote these, the, 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 the chronicles of this terrible event. And he wrote down all the names of the Chuetas. And so this book is what kept the, um, the infamy, if you will, of these uh, victims of the Mallorquin Inquisition. So the names, let's talk about that. There's probably over 330 last names that are in the Inquisition records in Mallorca, but only 15 of them are known as Chueta. Why? Because in the year 1755, yes, absolutely. In the year 1755, um, that is when they renewed the San Benito. So not only this book that I'm writing for you all in the chat window right now, um, was the way to remember all of these terrible heretics uh, in their opinion, but the San Benitos were hung up in the convent of Santo Domingo. And that is when all of the people from Mallorca would come to see the names, the heretics, and they would take their children on Sundays and they would say, look, these are the terrible Chuetas who killed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this was a way that these 15 last names were kept in, uh, as I said, in infamy. And what I find is fascinating is that you have last names. I have friends here in Mallorca, their last names are Salom, right? Aina Salom is a friend of mine, sounds like Shalom. Uh, Abraham, uh, Sabbat, sounds like Shabbat. These are not Chueta last names because we believe that they paid money to the Inquisition to get their names removed from the list. And so the 15 last names of Chueta names are the following that you can see here uh, in the presentation slide, okay? Many of you will probably stop at the last name Miro and think of Juan Miro, who actually uh, finished his, uh, his years here in Mallorca. He's actually not Chueta because he is the Miro family from Barcelona. So if you're Miro from Barcelona, you're not Chueta, but if you are the Miro family from Mallorca, you are Chueta. So, and I also think it's fun, phenomenal that in Mallorquin, the way you say last name is linaje, okay, lineage. Okay, it's, you got to remember here, it's all about your lineage, where you come from. Uh, so I find that, find that fascinating as well. So here are your 15 uh, Chueta last names. Let's do a quick time check. Okay, we're going to speed right along here. Um, I'm going to skip my Ensaimada story uh, for another time. You can see it on the virtual tour uh, if you uh, were to see that uh, another time. Uh, but basically, to, to, to give you the punchline, Ensaimada is an incredible dessert pastry here in Mallorca. It's very famous around the world. And it's a story about how I did not know uh, that it has Saim in it, Ensaimada, uh, which is um, Mallorquin for pork fat, lard. And so uh, what we've been doing here uh, with Limud Mallorca is taking back the ensaimada. And so we've taken out the word saim and put the word chala, and we are making the enchalamados uh, from now on. So um, you should uh, go and uh, learn more about that uh, at the, at the um, other tour. Uh, in the 1700s, you have a number of the wealthy chuetas uh, called peruques, meaning wigs, and they went to visit the king at the time to say, hey, this is unfair that we are treated like second-class citizens. So what could Chuetas not do? They were forced to live in a certain area. They could not carry jewelry. They could not ride on a horse. They could not uh, fight in the army or the navy. They could not go to university. Uh, they could not move up high in the church, for example. And you have to remember, these are devout Catholics. People were trying to prove their Catholicism, but they were always treated separately. And the most important of all, they always married within these 15 families because nobody wanted to marry with the Chuetas. It was like a stain on their family name. So this is hugely important for uh, today's Jewish community of Mallorca, which I hope I have time for to explain about and answer questions. 1820, you have the attack on the Comet de Santo Domingo. That is when the San Benitos are destroyed. From now on, you will no longer be able to see their names hanging. But think about that. From the 1400s to the 1800s, 
That's why it's so involved in the social fabric here in Mallorca, uh, because we're talking about centuries of disdain for these family names. And in 1823, the Argenteria or Silvermaker Street uh, was attacked, and this is where the Chuetas uh, were living. And still there are Chueta families that have jewelry shops on this street today, uh, which unfortunately is being changed to, to tourism. 1876, you have another example of Joseph Taranji Cortez, both Chueta last names, becomes a high priest outside of Mallorca. But when he comes back to Mallorca to preach, even though he has this incredible fame, he was not allowed to preach at the main church of Mallorca because he is Chueta. And here's this book that I was explaining before, Baruch Brownstein called The Chuetas of Mallorca, written in 1936. Uh, he's a New York Jew who came to Spain and went to Madrid and opened up all the Inquisition records. Phenomenal book. I highly recommend it for anyone who has been curiosity been sparked. And now a lot of what many people uh, are very interested in, uh, you know, getting to the today. So in the 60s, you have this tourism boom of Mallorca, which makes sense that the Chueta issue becomes less of a thing because when you have some Germans or Brits that are coming to Mallorca or even other people from Madrid or other parts of Spain, they don't know the difference between Chueta and non-Chueta. Everyone here is just from Mallorca. So that's when finally you start to see um, things start to calm down. Uh, an example, I have a friend named Mikel Segura who got married in 1960. He's Chueta and he married a non-Chueta and the, his wife's family came to the wedding, but all dressed in black in 1960 as a way of showing their uh, discontent that she was marrying someone of Chueta background. 1973, I had mentioned before uh, that British Ashkenazi expats established the cemetery. You can see that on the bottom right here, as well as, oops, excuse me, 1975, you have the death of the dictator uh, Franco. And in 1977, you have uh, someone of Chueta descent, Nikolai Aguilo, who was made fun of growing up on the streets that, that look much like this behind me, of Palma, for being Jewish, even though he, no one was Jewish in his family for centuries before that, decides to make Aliyah and see what is this whole being Jewish thing is about. He is now an ultra-Orthodox rabbi with 12 children living in Shiloh, and he goes by the name Rav Nisan Ben Abraham. And there was another Chueta rabbi living in Israel named Joseph Fuster. And it's so interesting. They come every now and then to our community and lead services. And they, you would think that they're, you know, from Poland or something, you know, they say Yiskadal, the Yiskadash, you know, they have this accent uh, when really they're originally from Mallorca. 1987, you see the synagogue below right here. That's, uh, that was started. <clears throat> These are all good questions that I see popping up. Um, the two important books also come out by Angela Selke, who talks specifically about the 1670s and this attempted boat escape and what happened, uh, the acts of faith, the, the terrible story. And on the right, you see In the Last Blue, which is a fictional account by Carmen Rieta. And, and the news just came out a couple months ago that uh, a director who is half Chueta, his father's Chueta, he's British, uh, named Rafael Cortez is his name. They just bought the rights to this book and they're going to be making a feature film about this uh, failed boat escape of uh, 1688. And in 2011, you have the incredible uh, decision that came down from Rav Nassim Karolitz of the neighbor rock. He's a Beit Din who said in the New York Times, it was published there, that um, if you are Chueta from your mother's side and you can prove it on a family tree, you are still Jewish. It's as if you never left because your ancestors were forcibly converted. They were forced to marry within and it's like they never left the Jewish faith. And so this is a huge bombastic uh, decision uh, because it's around this time in the early 2000s where you have about 10 or 15 um, Chuetas who were seeking to not convert to Judaism but to return to Judaism. So this is an example of a family tree, which is beautiful. Um, sorry, jumping here, Limud Mallorca, we started in April of 2018, uh, a beautiful mixture of expats from all around the world that are now living in Mallorca, along with people of Chueta descent 
uh, who, uh, who joined us for that very special day. It was a one day event uh, where we had many Chuetas telling their story uh, and we had uh, all different kinds of speakers. We had language uh, sessions in English, in Spanish and in Catalan. And then we come to the really important year of 2018, which is just the other name, just the other day. Uh, in May, for the first time ever, they renamed the street here in Palma after Katarina Taronji. And in August of 2018, you have the first ever Chueta wedding to take place in Israel. This is Tony Pina and Francisca Weiss. She is a family tree that shows that she is a descendant of Raphael Weiss, the last secret Jewish rabbi who was burned alive in 1691. And they got married under chuppah in August of 2018. Um, Shevei Yisrael was here no longer, but they were here helping uh, some of uh, the Chuetas come back to Judaism, those who wanted to or showed interest. And here you have a picture of myself with Ari Molina, Tony Pina, Rav Wallace, Rav Joseph Wallace, who believes he is a descendant of uh, Raphael Valls and Eliezer Lewinsky and Mikhail Segura, who's up here. These were, uh, this is a big, big thing where in August, 2018, we were elected as the uh, current board members of the shul. Two out of the four uh, board members are Chueta descent, Mikel Segura and Tony Pina. They have returned to Judaism, and this is huge for them uh, because we uh, basically are welcome, not only welcoming back to the community, but they are now the leaders of the community. And in that same year, all of this, by the way, happened to happen at the same time. It was not coordinated. Uh, after about 40 years of asking, the city hall finally put up a memorial in the place where um, this, uh, the acts of faith had happened, uh, where, the, um, where the public execution happened in Plaza Gomila. Um, and then this last uh, year ago, we had another Limud Mallorca where everyone you can see behind is a choir, a Catholic choir from a town in Mallorca. And the director of the choir is Chueta. And he sang Yerushalayim Shel Zahar for us uh, with this choir and the Atikva. Uh, as well. So closing up, guys, uh, is there a Jewish revival happening in Mallorca right now? I don't know. You guys be the ones to tell. We are making a documentary film about everything we're speaking about and more in this presentation today. Uh, we have the virtual tours that just was launched recently, which I can't wait to share with you all via email and ask that you to share it to other people as well. Uh, we are now doing virtual Shazooms every Friday that uh, our friend Abraham from Chile, who's here with us today, and Shoshana as well. Every Friday, if you want to come to connect, we have beautiful musicians. We have um, rabbis that check in every different week from all the parts of the globe. And it's amazing that a tiny community like us who doesn't have a rabbi, doesn't have a chazan, doesn't have Jewish education, we have very, very little. And we're trying our best to keep Judaism, Jewish life alive here. Now we're connected globally and getting this uh, beautiful uh, enrichment from other Jewish communities around the globe. Uh, we're also going into public schools and teaching about the Holocaust. This was a huge initiative as well. And basically to, uh, to close this out, I would love to uh, show you the teaser trailer for our virtual tour, which goes into way more detail of everything I just shared. And after that, uh, we'll have some time for questioning. So, once again, thank you guys so much and enjoy this uh, trailer that I'm going to put on for you guys right now. Oops, let me just make sure I share the sound as well. Okay, in three, two, one, action. <laughs> So guys, I want everyone to take a look around. I think streets really speak for themselves, and that's how you get to find out about the history. 1435, there's a mass conversion. Hundreds of Jews go into a church, they get baptized, and they come out as Christians. What happened in 1691 changed the course of history for these 15 families and all of their descendants. Why we're here in this world to connect with everyone. There are so many incredible characters like rabbis, philosophers, map makers, mathematicians, Mallorquins that were Jewish uh, that contributed so much. Sefarad in Hebrew means Spain. 
every archaeologist that I've shown this to says it is just a coincidence. You could see the top part of the Star of David. The Ensaimada might be from a Jewish bread. I think it's important that we learn about history so we can hopefully prevent from it to repeat. This is the unique story that I believe needs to be told. So thank you guys once again. Uh, we have three minutes for uh, questions and I'm gonna put the, uh, the website for the virtual tour. Remember, for being uh, atten awesome attendees that you are, uh, we're gonna send you via email, those who would like it uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a thank you. And we only ask that you share the link that I'm putting right here uh, to as many people as possible. We're trying to get this story out. We're, we're trying to let everyone know about this fantastic history that ha happened here. And um, we, hope, uh, we hope you enjoy. There's so much more. When the, the virtual tour is going through the streets of Palma and I'm pointing things out that you wouldn't see otherwise. And uh, I, I wish I had more time to share so much more information with you guys. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> Sorry if it felt rushed. <laughs> it's like so much to cram into a short period of time. Um, if anyone has any questions, now is a, a great time to um, let me make sure I save the chat here so I don't miss any other emails that were being put on to the chat. And uh, yeah, if anyone has anything they'd like to share, now is, uh, now is a great time. Can you answer the questions in the chat, please? Okay, which one was that? Which question? There are several. Oh, okay. Um, so going back through the chat, um, Okay, this was an interesting one that, that uh, you know, should we be teaching this history in Hebrew school? I believe so. I believe any history is important history and, and needs to be shared. And so I, I think absolutely that, that it's very, very important. Um, looking for any other uh, questions that might have come up. What languages are spoken in Mallorca? Well, it's... Uh, English uh, and German, as, as different foreign, many foreigners live here as well, it's quite international, uh, but Mallorquin is a dialect of Catalan and Spanish as well. Okay, so uh, other questions about the Jewish community today. Uh, there's about 20,000 Chuetas that uh, we know about, and only 10 or 15 of them have returned to Judaism. It's also very interesting, there have been many DNA, genetic testings done on the Chueta people, and they have shown chromosomes that have been linked to um, the old, old Jews, uh, Mizrahi Jews from originally Persia and from Iran. So a lot of the Chuetas that I'm friends with like to say that they actually probably have some of the most Jewish blood in the world because they've been forced to um, marry within their uh, group for, for, for centuries. There's a lot of very personal questions that I'm happy to respond to via email with as many people as possible. Um, yes, okay, so someone asked about the stigma. So today it depends. If you go to the Chueta areas that still have some jewelry stores and they have a Chueta name like Bonin or Seguda and you say, oh, nice to meet you, are, are you Chueta? Some of them would say, no, 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 I'm Catholic. I'm super Catholic. Like still to some older generation, Chueta is a taboo word. You don't talk about it. Um, I would say the majority don't care either way because now the stigma has fallen apart. Now there's a lot of uh, intermarriage and people are marrying without an issue now. And like I said, there's a few that go to the synagogue now that are very interested in their Jewish past and are interested in conversion. The issue is that we don't have a rabbi here and it's conversion is, is, a, is a very complicated procedure. Um, so, um, you know, we're doing our best to, to make it open and, and welcoming. Whoever wants to learn about Jewish culture and religion is, is, is free to come and do so. And so at our Rosh Hashanah event last year in September, we had over 200 people, 75% were not Jewish, that had never knew what Jewish New Year was. And they wanted to learn about it and, and come participate in it. And it was a really, really incredible event. It was really, really beautiful. Getting lots and lots of emails here. Any other questions? Um, yes, so a question is uh, about the DNA tests that are happening in Northern Portugal. And yes, absolutely um, is the same thing that is happening there. Um, 
the, the, they call them Marranos there, but the conversos of northern Portugal, very similar to the Chuetos of Mallorca in the sense that a lot of them have been keeping it in their families for, for, for a very, very long time. Um, the only thing that's different from what I understand is that it's not necessarily the specific last names like it is here in Mallorca with, uh, with the Chuetos last names. Is there pride if you determine you are Jewish? Some. Some absolutely uh, feel connected. And what's phenomenal is that you hear stories amongst the Chueta people that you know, give you uh, goosebumps. Uh, I had uh, some Chueta friends over for Passover three years ago, and I asked, what's a memory that they have of a holiday? And my friend Ferran talked about how every year around Easter, uh, his family would, instead of eating pork empanadas, would eat lamb empanadas for a week. And he never knew why until he started his uh, process of returning to Judaism and he learned about the, the story of Passover. So there are a few traditions that have actually made it through the centuries here, um, which is my personal interest of, of what, you know, you can't read this stuff in a history book. You have to go and speak to the people and, and, uh, and find out about it. Uh, some people have visited Braganza. Yeah, Braganza is an area of Northern Portugal that, is, um, that has the, a synagogue there as well as Belmonte. Uh, it's an area that I'm very, very uh, excited to learn about. Um, I guess we're, we're, we're going over, I don't know, Room C or, or Adam or, or Ari, I don't know uh, how much more time I, I get to go. If people want to stay, they can hang out, right? Thank you once again, guys. And uh, for those who did sign up, you will be getting an email once again. Um, really looking forward to open this conversation. And also just to let you know, there was an article that just came out in the Jewish Telegraph um, Agency about uh, Jewish tourism and educational tourism that's suffering right now due to COVID times. So we are one of those companies suffering. Uh, there's no tourism. And we don't know when it's gonna be coming back necessarily. Um, so right now what I'm dedicating to is by going to online events to different shuls or communities or uh, Sundays, or, you know, Jewish day schools, summer camps, so if anyone would like me to, uh, to uh, do a speaking engagement, I'm happy to do so. And once again, very excited to, uh, for you all to uh, enjoy the, the virtual tour of walking through the medieval streets of Palma with me. If you can't come see Palma right now, Palma can come see you. So thank you guys once again. Really, really appreciate uh, you guys coming to check me out with so many other amazing uh, offers at the same time. So.